So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Abbott. Um, I think he needs no introduction. I think he is uh, well-known, well-beloved, both here as well as nationally and internationally uh, for his work, um, his research, his mentorship of students of all colors, um, postdocs, on, around. Um, today he's going to talk about closing in on the molecular pathogenesis of PCOS and some of, some of the contributions that I'm very thankful he made to my field. So standing on the shoulder of a giant here. Um, and so without further ado, I'll let him speak. And I just wanted to close by saying, if it's not Scottish, it's crap. Good. I like it. Yeah. SNL rules. Love it. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, this is a success story based out of this department. And I based my promotion to, professor to professorship on it, and it paid off. And it was thankful, Christian. Can you turn the sound down a wee bit? I think I'm echoing up there. Oh, okay. Um, and thanks to the number two in REI at the time, Dan Jumezic. This is a partnership between basic science and clinical science. So we actually deal with the questions with our two respected knowledges. This is what we need to know in the clinic. This is where basic science is saying the story is going. Stop talking around each other, work together, answer the questions that really direct information both ways. And that's what we try to do here. And I hope you feel that as I go through. And rather than focusing on bits of it, I'm trying to go, are we closing in on a molecular understanding on the basis of PCOS and trying not to get out into exactly what promoter sequence we're looking at and which gene to give you more of the overview and how the monkeys led the way. And it's been my uh, privilege through all these years to work with animals like the rhesus monkeys. And when you say why, if you can't understand from just looking at mum and babe here, why that would be a privilege, yeah, I don't have to say anymore. Uh, it's marvelous to work with animals like this. They're so close to us genetically, physiologically, developmentally, they tell us a lot. And I am standing with colleagues, Dan to begin with, who's now at UCLA, and also John Levine now here in neuroscience, as well as director of the Primate Center. We have one of the seven national primate centers. We have a marvelous imaging facility here without this campus and this department integrated in some of the research it does, it wouldn't be there. And this was all leveraged, over 5.5 million in NIH dollars now and counting on a R&D committee research grant that you bet on this and it paid off big time. So if you aren't doing it already, put in an R&D grant, work together and make more of a difference than you would otherwise. And this department's right in there and investing and it pays off. Okay, and students, yeah, Bria is about to graduate from med school here now, was an undergrad going to family medicine, sorry, not OBGYN for this one. Uh, and a graduate student, Marissa Cranach, in the ERP program, going to graduate this summer. You might see her elected to public office one day. That's where she wants to go. Uh, John's lab here and a series of colleagues at the various primate centers who helped make this happen. Now, of course, I just realized I didn't work out how to move the slides. Oh, Christian. Oh, ah, ah, okay. Yeah, you see, I'm a Luddite, technologically challenged. Okay, I am not paid for saying any of that. And this is prostate cancer related work that you're not gonna hear about today with uh, my links with Inocrine. Where the talk's gonna go, we're gonna deal with polycystic ovary syndrome. What is it? Just in case you haven't had a brush up recently, but we'll go over that quickly. Uh, the developmental origins hypothesis. Yes, going back to the last century, when this all started here. Uh, and we broke the mold and other people's words, not mine, broke the paradigm of how to understand PCOS. It's a developmental origins issue. Doesn't just appear at puberty. And how we're gonna look at some of the convergence on pathogenic mechanism, monkeys and people. How the uh, testosterone, which is the villain of the piece here, gets into constraining our ability to make mature fat cells and store fat safely, we actually now have a naturally occurring like model. All this is actually experimentally generated. And we found out that in our primate center, if we actually sampled the whole population, they're naturally occurring high testosterone monkeys. 
Oh, and you'll see what they look like. This is an ancient issue, and it's going well before we appeared on the planet. And the primates have been playing at this for a long time. And then weight gain, some of our very recent gene silencing techniques using viruses and brain imaging here on campus that I find out we're the only ones in the game because this is the only place almost in the planet that you can do this in. So uh, when you think of what you've got here, go and use it. It's amazing, this campus. Okay, PCOS, what is it? Rotterdam, 2003, settled it. People are still arguing, should it be called this name? What, is, what are the diagnostic criteria? Everybody's decided this is what they are uh, for years and years and years, and that's what we're following with the monkeys. You need two out of the following three to be clinically diagnosed. We're doing the same with the monkeys as PCOS. Uh, the ovary is overachieving at making testosterone. Notice the definition from Rotterdam, greater than two standard deva deviations above your control mean because the testosterone assays vary around the world, uh, even with the same sample. Even with liquid chromatography mass spec, they still vary. So you have to deal with your lab and your place and stick with your numbers. Above two standard deviations, PCOS. Does everybody use this? No, but that's the Rotter those are the Rotterdam criteria. Or you use excess body hair scores as a clinical uh, biomarker. Accompanying pathophysiology, pituitary hypersecretion, diminished ability of estradiol and progesterone to control negative feedback. The ovary is underachieving in ovulating regularly about once a month, or they're just absent. And in the ovary, there are too many growing follicles, non-dominant follicles, the uh, PCO ovary loves growing these. Here's an ultrasound picture down here, an old one now, but you get the hint. All those little black dots in the ovary here are growing follicles. It's not focusing on growing one dominant follicle between the pair of ovaries, as we have here on the normal ovary, a big follicle ahead of the rest, the dominant follicle that will ovulate in that cycle. The PCOS ovary is all about doing lots of things apart from organizing itself to ovulate regularly. Now, apart from infertility, too much body hair that's going on here, it brings a lovely package of metabolic dysfunction where your Department of Medicine colleagues elbow their way in here because the greatest number of new cases of type 2 diabetes, PCOS amongst young women, 20s and 30s. Uh, and the pancreas isn't compensating for the insulin resistance in here. Uh, they have a metabolic difference. They just, they don't eat more. They are, they're just built to try and store fat and use it. Okay. Uh, so they're hyperlipidemic. And where we come in, gestational diabetes. Almost half PCOS pregnancies will get into gestational diabetes. There's another issue for us. That's not the diagnostic criteria, but part of the problem. And I'm going to try and link the two of these as we go through. Now, the phenotypes, because if you look at all those three criteria, you need at least two or three of them. You, the severe or classic PCOS has all three or high testosterone, lack of cycles. Clinical referrals that have been used for most of the studies, those are the majority of PCOS and clinical referrals. The minority come from, yeah, you can get regularly ovulating PCOS, or you have PCOS where it's just lack of cycles, polycystic ovaries, their T levels are fine. They are, they're the minority. Now, if you go to unselected human populations where you go out to the population and ask for volunteers to uh, consent to being studied, it's the reverse. The majority are these more mild forms of PCOS, not the severe classic, okay? That's gonna become interesting when we get into the monkeys. All right, what do we know about the molecular bit about PCOS? Well, it's highly familiar. Familial means it runs in families, very heritable. It looks as though it's polygenic and the bit we've added, developmental origins before puberty. It's now how this is generally considered in the literature. Uh, the 21 risk genes that have now been identified thanks to uh, many uh, genome-wide studies around the world this is fantastic, the problem being it accounts for less than 5% of PCOS. We're getting down to the molecules, 
But whereas the 90% understanding is still missing. Uh, when we do look at genes, a lot of them are to do with gonadotropin secretion and action. And I'm going to come back to this one here as we get into the molecular mechanism, the DENDA 1A, because it enables LH signaling and a few other receptor signalings as well, but that one in particular. Also to do with this is TGF beta signaling. That's to do with extracellular matrix anti-malarian hormone, AMH, that regulates the number of follicles growing in the ovary, they all signal through TGF beta molecules. That's another grouping that I'll come back to. And a whole series of other genes that affect other cell functions that I'm not going to focus on so much. But in all of this, if we look at what is the most heritable thing up here, it's high testosterone. That has come over and over again as the most heritable trait. Now, in all of this, the problem is, where are the animal models uh, that we can develop to try and get new insight into the molecular understanding and manipulate that we cannot ethically do with people? And uh, can we lead to better therapeutics that way? That's where we come in. Developmental origins is our contribution to this. Yes, we're going back to the last century and into the double, uh, double O's in this century, because we came up with a hypothesis that the ovary doesn't just become high T at puberty, it's that way when it differentiates during fetal development. And we know what testosterone does if you raise it in a female individual during gestation. It masculinizes the phenotype. But is re what's really happening is reprogramming multiple organs to function with what's expected to turn up a testes. Here, the testes aren't going to turn up, but we're going to get the high testosterone, okay? So we hypothesize that and that the high testosterone would, because we're not changing the gene variants, but we're changing the way they're packaged by methylation so that they can be transcribed and translated more or less than they should be. If we just do that, can we mimic PCOS? It's not what are the variants doing, maybe allowing genes to be expressed more or less. That's what may be going on. And the key part to it, and maybe just an amplifier, is that fetal exposure to testosterone. Okay? That was our hypothesis. It would uh, increase LH levels because the ovary just can't cut it in producing enough steroid to actually keep it under control and that it would work on adipocytes to cause uh, hyperinsulinemia, and the two now work as co-gonadotrophins, insulin, LH, and FSH, to diminish ovulation. And any genes you have that regulate insulin, uh, ovarian function, could add to this, including a high testosterone maternal environment with a placenta that can't aromatize that so much. And we now know that does occur in PCOS. When we started, I already said, oh, that one's just nonsense. Turns out the PCOS placenta is vulnerable. Okay, what did we do to begin with? We actually injected mothers, monkey mothers, with testosterone during gestation. And here is a, in graphic form, a rhesus monkey gestation, the three trimesters. Birth is 165 days. It's about five months. Yes, it's way shorter than ours, but it follows a simil similar pattern if you translate with gonadal differentiation starting about day 40, as it, we would expect during the first trimester, and finishing up somewhere about mid-gestation. So we are giving high testosterone to mum that we know will overwhelm the placenta's ability to aromatize and inactivate it to give fetal testosterone levels to female offspring. Okay, that's what this little red panel is here. And we're going to catch genital differentiation. Uh, uh, the GnRH neurons migrating from the nose to the hypothalamus as they do to their final home to run our reproductive systems. Behavioral differentiation, hence the masculinization bit. It's turning up in PCOS as well. The ovary is undergoing oogenesis, laying down oocytes, and just starting to put down primordial follicles. We're catching that, as well as uh, organs like the pancreas is differentiating. We're starting to catch 
adipose stem cells as well in this time period and reprogram them with this testosterone. Now we stop and let everything run from there. What did this single intervention that we do and stop when the ovary actually develops its ability to make androgens before it makes estrogens during fetal life? Okay, what do we end up with? We ended up with, they were actually called roly-poly monkeys. That is not my name for them, those were the caretakers. <laughs> because we ended up with relatively infertile monkeys that look like this, quite different to their close female fertile kin. Okay, with that one intervention. Now, to cut a long story short, what was their phenotype that led us to the molecular understanding? Okay, here's the gestation period again. Now we're looking at early to mid gestation when we're giving the testosterone injections. What about controls? Oil injections, okay? And some of them were just no treatment at all here. It didn't matter, the oil injections versus nothing, we couldn't tell those animals apart. But we did do controls as well. We're talking about the 12 here that uh, went, underwent this. When adult, we're now talking about really mature animals at this point. They had ovarian hyperandrogenism. When challenged, that ovary produced too much testosterone. They had basically elevated testosterone anyway, but it was ovarian origin. Okay, adrenal got into the game a wee bit too, but the ovary was the powerhouse. Sorry, Marco Rubio moment, my throat's getting dry. Okay, now, uh, intermittent or absent cycles. Enlarged polyfollicular ovaries. Now remember, a dominant follicle here is five millimeters. Oh God, it's driving us nuts trying to work out what a small non-dominant follicle is because of the technology. Okay, we'll get there, but um, this is probably an underestimate. Poor oocyte quality, we've done IVF on these monkeys because this is all leading to transgenic monkeys as it's not part of the story, but the oocyte quality is down. And that led to a human study to find out it was all about the meiotic uh, regulation. Genes were changed in PCOS ovaries, sorry, PCOS, eggs from PCOS women versus non-PCOS women. The monkeys led us there. Everybody said the eggs are just fine or they're just awful. Um, and uh, I, I know Christy has probably got her own opinion about that one. Uh, and LH hypersecretion, we've disrupted negative feedback. It's a different set point. And, and we've done the experiments, there's diminished estradiol negative feedback there. You've got to really raise it to a level you'd have to raise it to in a male to bring that LH under control. Okay, so we got um, phenotypes out of these monkeys, severe classic, ovulatory or normal androgenic, majority the severe classic. Remember that's where the clinical referral studies are with women. The monkeys were matching phenotypes, not just across the board and what they were showing, but in the types of phenotypes that occurred. With the one single intervention, we caused a variety of phenotypes. We're doing this on different genetic backgrounds. And that's playing into the role of giving us our different phenotypes with that one elevated testosterone intervention too. And these are the clinical referral studies. Now, because these are we're giving testosterone this early. We're also getting longer anogenital distance, a fetal determined trait by testosterone, and a longer second finger, okay, I gotta be careful here. Second finger to fourth finger ratio. You look at your fingers and you can have a shorter one or a longer one. Uh, sorry, that finger, okay. Uh, that, yeah, that, yeah, notice the finger I'm holding up. Uh, now, that is a fetally determined trait as well. And shorter or longer second fingers to the fourth finger means there's been some testosterone exposure, okay? And with PCOS, it's the longer version. Oh, and the monkeys too. Everybody's now looking at their fingers. There is an overlap, there's an overlap. So if you come up with, oh my God, that's gonna, uh, it's okay, there's, there's an overlap. It's not, it's not definitive, yeah. But I tell you, when the monkeys first put their hands down, and I was going, oh, it's meant to be a shorter second digit. And I went, this is not going to turn out well. That's longer. I, I, I'm going to measure it. But you can just see the second digit's longer. The monkeys led the way in opening up the understanding. That can happen. It's not just shorter 
that uh, length of that second digit. Okay, the arrays here, same genes that organize the arrays in the ovary and the testes. That's why they get affected by the fetal testosterone, okay? Same genes. All right, now, I said molecular. What are we going to look at? We are going to look at DNA methylation of gene promoter sites because if you look at the gene variants, we didn't touch them. We're just we're doing phenotypic change. And so we work with Mark Godarzy at Cedar sinai uh, Department of Medicine in LA, and used his expertise, because he's involved in the genetic studies in PCOS and epigenetic studies. He was the go-to person and his postdoc uh, to do this. And yes, this is going back to the double O's in this century. So we're using a DNA methylation array that's out of date now. Uh, now it's hundreds of thousands of genes they put on here. Here we only had, we had about 15,000, okay? We then selected from our monkey, we looked at visceral fat. That's the fat that surrounds your um, gastrointestinal tract in the abdomen uh, to see, because that's significantly different in PCOS in these monkeys, what we'd see with our, our genome. And to cut a long story short and focus on the adults, 325 genes were significantly differently packaged in this tissue in our uh, PCOS-like monkeys. And then just to say, okay, I'm just, how does this look like? And I'm not gonna get you into this. Basically, if you're trying to load up the animals so that the darker bits here, over here mean more methylation and as you get lighter and uh, over here, uh, you get less methylation. All the controls are over here and all the PCOS-like monkeys are over here. There's an increase in methylation. Now that's normally thought to be, oh, gene silencing. Can be, but some of those genes are repressors. So when you silence them, you let loose the gene they were suppressing. So uh, methylation means we change things, but not necessarily silencing things. Okay, now you're gonna go, oh my God, uh, genes all over the place here. We need bioinformatics to pull together what do all these changes mean in trying to get some sense out of this. And when you just look at one pathway analysis versus another, it's helpful. But when I'm now gonna compare several different findings, if they start to say the same thing, you're closing in on something. What you're seeing here is in our adult monkeys, uh, compared to controls, this was the top most significant, by far, altered network of genes that could be pulled together to get as many of these significantly methylated changes on one place, okay? At the heart of this, in blue squares there, gonadotrophin signaling related genes. Uh, if you, I know you're probably not into it, but collagen, TGF beta receptor, collagen again, BMP signaling here is the other heart of it. That's extracellular matrix related genes are all there. And genes involved in regulating oocyte and ovarian function, side by side at the heart of this network uh, that's changed. If we now look at a single pathway that's changed in these monkeys, the top one was TGF beta. Does this start to stand, sound like a similar story to what we're finding with gene changes in women? You betcha it is. But these aren't the genes, these are how they're packaged. And you'll see the significant ones are in pink with the arrows showing if they're hypomethylated or hypermethylated there. And you'll see these are the hits we're getting here to bring this pathway to significance. And yes, the infants, even when, uh, I'm not really going to go into them, at two months of age, they have a significant hit on a key TGF beta intracellular signaling molecule, SMAD4, that fits right in here as well. This is significantly changed in these animals. They're regulating their extracellular matrix. How you make room for growing follicles in the ovary is all part of this, and fat cells is going on here. The convergence that's turning out here was to do with that LH signaling. Okay, this is a diagram that started two years ago by Jerry Strauss and Jan McAllister in Virginia and in Hershey at Penn State looking at DENDA-1A that enables LH signaling in the calveoli of cells. 
yes, in fat cells, they do this too, because they're very steatogenic. And uh, PCOS women make a lot of testosterone in their fat cells. These are also in theca cells in the ovary. And you need DENDA1A to enable LH signaling. And in PCOS women that have this variant, they upregulate this ability. So the ovary is overdriving whatever LH does. And in theca cells, LH pulls together all these molecules to form a transcription complex that sits on a gene promoter to drive the androgen biosynthetic enzyme and the enzyme that starts steatogenesis and gets you pregnenolone from cholesterol. That's what this does, and it's hyped up in the variant. The asterisks there are the genes identified through our methylation studies in visceral fat in our monkeys. They're involved in the same pathway. It's not identical. We're not hyping, we're not altering the same genes, but they're playing a role in regulating the same pathway that's job is to drive steatogenesis, particularly androgen production. Here's the convergence that's occurring. One is gene packaging, one is gene variant. They may be ending up in the same place. In other words, there's more than one molecular way to do this, but the convergence is here. Here's your therapeutic target. Not here, here, okay? And can we diminish that with, uh, with a particular molecule that will diminish binding? Not stop it, you don't want to stop this, but you want to, you want to almost make it less functional so you can uh, reduce the drive to androgenicity in PCOS. That's what this is showing. Where the where's the human story gone? Okay, but in PCOS, do we really see high testosterone during gestation? The, the papers are now coming in, the answer is more and more. Because as you know, you don't go in and go, oh yeah, we'll just go in and stick a needle into baby and let's see what's circulating in baby's blood. Not a good idea. Okay, not with our technology anyway. So. One study out of Italy showed high testosterone in mid-gestation amniotic fluid from daughters of women with PCOS versus uh, women who did not have PCOS and daughters. Uh, individuals looking at umbilical cord values because that's usually where you can go. Now we've got half of these studies showing high androgen levels from PCOS daughters at this time. The initial study said, no, no, it's lower. Now the studies are starting to go the other way, okay? So in what this is saying is PCOS is not one beastie, but there could be uh, underlying commonalities amongst a lot of it. There's longer anagental distance, newborn daughters of women with PCOS and in adult women with PCOS. There are now three studies, because I just heard today, one of the studies I've been working on with University of Rochester, they got accepted in the, in the Journal of uh, Developmental Origins. That's adding to this, three studies now showing an increased fetal T biomarker in PCOS, either women or newborn daughters of women with PCOS. There's facial sebum secretion in newborn daughters. Uh, usually not, but if they're born to PCOS women, Usually now there is. That's a testosterone biomarker. There's too much sebum being produced on the face. And that's there. We're trying to add here with Chanel and with Cara in MFM, a study that's halfway through looking at baby hair, because that's where you store your exposure to testosterone for three months. That's how doping agencies now look at athletes. And if they shave their hair, they're really suspicious especially if it's all their body hair. Okay, enough said about that one. Um, high testosterone with longer or shorter finger ratios. We, we dealt with that, three studies now. And diminished placental aromatase expression in PCOS pregnancies. Two studies now showing that, okay? It's getting there. This is an occurrence in a lot of PCOS pregnancies. How am I gonna get the constraint to uh, fat in here? Okay, yeah, another diagram that you don't want to see, I know. And it's fat, it's got nothing to do with the ovary. Bear with me, testosterone's gonna come in here. Uh, our fat depots are made up of lots of cells, not just fat cells. And they have stem cells in there because we are replacing our fat cells all the time, okay? Normally, they're recruited by a zinc finger um, transcription factor here, 
to be a preadipocyte instead of a muscle cell or a bone cell or a cartilage cell. Okay, this is our stem cell depot, and it can be pushed in various directions by whatever transcription factors really hyped up in the cell at the time. So we have different cell lines going on with, with different programming. Uh, our hypothesis was that uh, we're going to see this elevated. We're going to drive too many of these precursor cells to be pre -diphocytes. And how do we get this insight? Gregorio Chasenbark, working with Dan Jemezic at UCLA, looking at normal human fat cells, normal ones, that testosterone diminishes all these transcription factor genes, so it really diminishes the ability of these pre to become mature fat cells. If you don't have a lot of these, you can't store fat safely, and it gets stored in the liver, the pancreas, not good places to store it, or you're just hyperlipidemic as well. Not good. That's why we're looking at this, because of the testosterone regulation. And I know I'm going fast here, and what's regulating that zinc finger? Well, yeah, we're going we're to get to that. In the monkeys, they led the way here, because they hadn't looked at PCOS women yet. The uh, PCOS-like adult monkeys that prenatally androgenized, all the adipocytes are shunted to the left there. There are too many small ones. Uh, one of the genes that's important for maturing those adipocytes into nice big storage ones is significantly down. And the higher the monkey's testosterone level, like in our PCOS monkey, PCOS like monkeys, lo the lower that gene. Okay? And here's the zinc finger gene that commits them to pre adipocytes from stem cells. It's up and it correlates with pre fatty acids and in some studies with insulin. That's related to you're trying to deal with storing fat and commit stem cells to fat cells, but you're not maturing them. So in our monkeys, blue line PCOS-like monkeys, red controls, total free fatty acids here during an intravenous glucose tolerance test, basal overnight fasted, uh, glucose stimulated, insulin stimulated, the controls can't catch up. They can't get enough of that, that fatty acid into storage properly. They don't have enough fat cells, and I'm, yeah, I'm going to skip that. Uh, they then went on to look at this in PCOS women, published last year. The same shift of the adipocytes in PCOS women to the left, too many small ones, and that zinc finger gene significantly elevated, and a complex constraint going on into maturing those adipocytes in PCOS women. They have the same issue, they're hyperinsulinemic, and they're starting to drift towards metabolic issues. There are otherwise lean and young women here. Okay, naturally occurring PCOS. Uh, okay, just a lot of things to say. We work with a lot of groups. Thank you very much to help do this around the country. We have electronic health records to help with everything as well. And yeah, technicalities of making sure we co collected the samples at the right time of year, follicular phase, and so on. These are otherwise normal monkeys, and we're trying to see if we look for high testosterone monkeys, do they have PCOS-like traits? Basic hypothesis here. The two different populations, these are our, our guys, totally environmentally controlled. This is around Halloween, so they're getting their candy treats. They live socially. Oh, yeah, no, they're, okay, we don't make them obese, otherwise, no, nah, that would not be good. So they're normally fed a low-fat, high-fiber diet. The guys in Yerkes in Atlanta, because the climate doesn't try and kill them for most of the year, uh, live outside. These are monkeys, are tropical living. And their uh, Halloween treats are they get to carve pumpkins their way. So they eat half of them as well. Okay. Uh, two different populations. We looked at their testosterone levels, LCMS determined. We haven't done anything with these animals. We're just sampling them. Okay. Here's the testosterone range from about, uh, uh, these are nanograms per mil, so if you want nanograms per deciliter, you multiply these by 100, say 65 nanograms per deciliter at the top there. Not too different to human values. The means in both populations were smack on at about 0.21 nanograms per mil. We were going for a definition of high T, one standard deviation above there, okay? If we wanted to really look at PCOS equivalents, we're at that two standard deviations up here, not too many. And I'm just gonna focus on them uh, right now here to show you. So what do these high T guys have up here? 
Okay, we're coming down to just those in the follicular phase, not pregnant or other things that are going on. Our monkeys here in Wisconsin, generally hyperandrogenic. They have high MH levels. They're polyfollicular. They have high LH. Five out of six of these tries we could, they weren't getting pregnant. Those are the records. That's not me trying this and moving animals around. It's the colony. Uh, there's a fertility problem. They've got thickened in uterine endometrium and their anogenital distance correlates positively with their androstene dyon levels, showing the higher the androstene dyon level, the longer that anogenital distance, and that distance was determined by mid-gestation. This has been a high ongoing androgen capability here. At Yerkes, these are now outside exercising animals. Uh, we're still getting general hyperandrogenism. There's a trend for AMH to be high and polyfollicular. And their, their ovaries, because we're doing ultrasound on these guys, are enlarged as they would be in PCOS. So not exactly the same, but we're still getting issues that are around the same thing here, and we've done nothing to them. And this just says they're all nice prime ages, lean, they're not obese. Uh, that's what that says, okay? Now, their phenotypes. These are our monkeys here in Wisconsin. The majority of their phenotype are the mild form of PCOS, normal androgenic ovulatory. They are like the unselected human populations, not like the clinical referrals. Our experimental model is like the clinical referrals. So here we have two different types of hyperandrogenism naturally occurring, experimentally induced. We're matching up with the unselected human PCOS here, and then the other one, we're matching up with the um, endemic population. I'm going to try and wrap this up shortly so I can let you guys go. We can genotype those animals back out here. We can genotype all these guys. Individually now, the rhesus genome is known. We could only do it with uh, about 40 of them right now. And even though we haven't got a significant hit, when we come do all the multiple comparison uh, p-value corrections, for 40 animals, the human studies people were amazed. And what was coming up? The largest hit was a gene regulating collagen and extracellular matrix, a gene regulating transcription repression of GnRH1, gonadotrophin function, and TGF beta signaling. Does that sound familiar? another convergence on a similar constellation of issues, this time gene variants in our monkeys. Okay, last thing, uh, because just say, where are we going with some of this? We are using viral vectors that we can now gene silence very specifically in animals to look at what's going on. And just to say, where are we taking some of this to actually really functionally show it, is just to say that we can use the facilities here to infuse virus and gene silence, and then follow them now here for 20 months in the follicular phase or anovulatory period. And for those of you not used to looking at a rhesus monkey MRI of the brain, this is a coronal section through the brain where you're at the level of the pituitary, or the anterior pituitary. This is the hypothalamus. Here we have the cortex here, and there's the rest of the monkey's head out here, okay? Where we are interested in is the ventral medial nucleus and the arcuate nucleus here, because these are where we control metabolic function, as being shown in mice and rats down to the molecular level. We're not sure about us. And here in monkeys and in, in all sorts of animals, this is where we control GnRH release, the gonadotropins. What we've done here is we've infused with contrast agent, so you can see it shining up here in the brain, and the animal has been wheeled around from the surgery into the scanner, and you can see where the cannula tracks were up here that were coming down. They're no longer there. That is contrast agent in a solution containing viruses that are infecting those nerve cells and silencing the gene, one of the genes for estrogen receptor, this case alpha. Otherwise, the cell's fine. It's gonna light up green, because we've also loaded those viruses with a green fluorescent protein, so we know where we went. Uh, and just to show you, because those experiments are still ongoing, some monkeys we worked on earlier, mamas at monkeys, to do the same thing. Whoops, 
back up one. Here we have, these are coronal sections now through the same part of the brain, except this is after necropsy. This is showing a visual representation of, of binding by an antibody that binds green fluorescent protein. Here we are, we've infected the cells in the VMN and ARC. Here's a control where we put in a scrambled virus that doesn't silence anything. This is just the number of the anti primary antibody. All these little chocolate drops here, those are the nerve cells expressing ER alpha. And the ones we gene silenced are over here. Here's an example. Pretty much all gone, but the pituitary is still showing up very nicely. Okay, what is one phenotype I want to tell you about apart from reproductively what happened? Nothing yet, it's rather boring. So I'm just going to skip over that. Yeah, they're still cycling and everything's normal. They've lost control of their body weight. They totally lost control of their body weight, just like a mouse or rat. Well, that was the hypothesis. I'm not trying to say primates are like mice and rats. But actually here, molecularly, it looks as though they are. The change in body weight kicked in pretty much straight away, but it took a year. Mice, this takes three or four weeks. Ah, not in monkeys. A year. And there's the increase. These animals are now putting on fat all over the place. It looks as though they're hyperinsulinemic, maybe heading into insulin resistance here. And if that keeps going, that could overdrive the ovary into high testosterone. We're waiting to see. That's where we're going with that. So putting it all together, monkeys gave us novel insights and triangulating to the same general molecular cluster that links to PCOS. You, and in these three ways, women are experimentally induced animals are naturally occurring animals. Uh, where is it centering around? LH secretion and action and extracellular matrix. That involves ovary, it involves adipose tissue, it involves brain, uh, this, and that's where PCOS is. And what we're hoping here that with our imaging, yeah, the surgery start at 3 a.m. So we can get in before all the human studies and we finish about 1 to 2 p.m. So if you are bored and want to do something in the small hours of the morning and you're doing a clinic, you can come and join us. Um, so we can actually get this done and look at actually gene silencing now of one gene after another, what they functionally do. And that's the power of these models that this department helps support. And thank you for staying and listening. Cheers.